honored to be invited to be with you. Tell you the truth, though, since I spent 22 years as a Washington lawyer, and then some time out at the CIA and the Clinton administration, I'm actually honored to be invited into any polite company for any purpose <laughs> at all. One of my former colleagues at Booz Allen, where I worked on energy for several years uh, recently, um, used to say that with energy, you have two kinds of problems, not one, malignant and malevolent. Malignant problems are problems that nobody's actually trying to create. They occur because you create systems or disturbances in systems that lead the system to some sort of cascading failure, somewhat like metastasis in the human body. One such system is, of course, the ecosphere. People in network theory talk uh, about the butterfly effect. Butterfly flutters its wings on one side of the world. Ecosphere is a complex system. May create a tornado on the other side of the world. Eh, you know, seems a little hypothetical until you realize that five years ago, last August, tree branch touched a power line in Cleveland during the middle of a summer storm. And within nine, count them, nine seconds, some 50 million electricity consumers were without electricity. Uh, some of them for many days, took out much of the northeastern United States and eastern Canada. Now, we tried to take a leaf from the book of the South Park kids and blame Canada. <laughs> but the Canadians, in their polite fashion, pointed out to us that actually uh, Cleveland's south of Lake Erie, not north. <laughs> and we kind of had to fess up to the fact that it was our tree branch and our power lines. So it's not only the ecosphere that is a complex system that we can cause, in a sense, to metastasize by pumping huge amounts of uh, uh, carbon into it. Uh, but our energy grid here in North America uh, has gotten very, very uh, uh, fragile as a result of being heavily overloaded and requires a lot of the software improvements that Rob talked about. There are a number of things we need to do to deal with malignant problems to our energy infrastructure. One that didn't occur but almost did was Hurricane Katrina missed the Colonial Pipeline, the major pipeline from the Gulf up to the East Coast, by a very, very small uh, distance. Uh, had we lost the Colonial for some days, we on the East Coast would have been doing a good deal more walking and bicycle uh, riding. Probably would have been healthier, but it would have uh, uh, been a economic uh, catastrophe. So all of our energy infrastructure that we've constructed and the ecosphere, most importantly, are vulnerable to the, the malignant effects of our putting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere, of our driving SUVs, of our 97 percent dependence on, on oil uh, for transportation. Uh, all of these malignant effects are occurring and we need to deal with them. Now, it's, uh, nobody's trying to sink Bangladesh and Florida beneath the waves out several decades from now by driving SUVs, but we may be contributing to that end. And what we need to do is deal with the technical problems of uh, energy, these malignant problems, by moving away from putting carbon into the atmosphere. And that, in turn, is going to be, there's going to be a transitional period in which we're going to have to use some coal. Hopefully, we can get it as clean as possible, as quickly as possible, and not only capture, but sequester the carbon. We're probably going to need some nuclear. We can do as, uh, as much as we possibly can with energy efficiency uh, and, uh, and with renewables, especially. But while we work the malignant problem, we have to realize that with respect to oil, there's another set of problems as well malevolent problems. Now, Einstein used to say, God may be sophisticated, but he's not plain mean. And what I think Einstein meant by that was that since for him God and nature were pretty much the same thing, when you're playing against nature, trying to build a bridge, discover E equals MC squared, whatever, you may be facing a very sophisticated problem but there's nobody on the other side trying to make it harder for you. Certainly nobody over there trying to kill you. But with respect 
to a major aspect of our problems with oil, that is in fact the case. There is somebody, some groups, on the other side trying to make the transition away from it harder and indeed, quite literally, trying to kill us. What do we need to keep in mind as we think about those malevolent problems from oil's 97% dominance of our transportation? Well, first of all, we're now borrowing something on the order of $2 billion a day to import oil, over $700 billion a year. If oil goes back up to around $150 a barrel, we'll be up to close to a trillion dollars a year. Trillion here, trillion there, before you know it, it adds up. <laughs> the Middle East is earning uh, oil importers as a whole are earning uh, something uh, on the order of $3 trillion a year now. In the Middle East, having two-thirds of the world's proven reserves of conventional petroleum, uh, uh, is increasingly, as it becomes more and more the dominant of uh, world uh, oil supplies, uh, going to be uh, earning even more. By writing $2 billion a day worth of uh, IOUs, would you think that we might be having some negative effect on the value of the dollar? I would think so. We can help with that set of problems a bit by producing a bit more oil in this country, but that's not the long-term uh, solution. The long-term solution is to move away from oil as our source of transportation, and frankly, to do so as quickly and as devastatingly as possible. Now, oil is, of course, used for other things. It's used for home heating. It's used for a little bit for electricity generation, used for chemical plants. But in those other applications, it has competitors. The problem with, trans with transportation is that for all practical purposes, the two-thirds of oil that we use for transportation has a monopoly. There are no real competitors that can take it on today. There are many standing in the wings. There are a few getting out there and getting going. Plug-in hybrids, first pilot plants of cellulosic ethanol, et cetera. There are things getting started. But as of today, we are massively dependent on oil uh, for transportation. What is, what's the consequence of that? There are a bunch of them. One is that. Uh, when he wants more oil produced, the president has to go hat in hand to the king of Saudi Arabia. Even then, doesn't have much effect. At least King Abdullah, you can talk to. King Abdullah is sort of an octogenarian Saudi Gorbachev. Uh, he's a reformer in Saudi terms. Now, it doesn't take a lot to be a reformer in Saudi terms. <laughs> King Abdullah, for example, is willing to talk occasionally about the hypothetical possibility of ruminating on the thought that someday women might be permitted to drive automobiles. <laughs> Believe me, that's enough to make you a reformer in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but uh, someday before too long, when King Abdullah is no longer king, in order to find someone to go hat in hand to, a president of the United States might find, uh, for example, uh, on the throne of Saudi Arabia, Prince Nayef. Prince Nayef um, is the boss of, among other things, the religious police in Saudi Arabia. And his view of the world is probably best understood by something that happened a few years ago when there was a fire at a girl's school in Riyadh. The firefighters dashed in trying to put out the fire. The religious police dashed in. And they did their job as dictated by the policies of Prince Nayef, they began shoving the little girls back into the burning school because they didn't have their veils on right. So it will not be particularly helpful, I don't think, for a pr future president of the United States to have to go to a King Nayef to ask uh, for anything, especially if that president's a woman. 